Good afternoon and welcome to today's EHS Today webcast, Machine Guarding Back to Basics, sponsored by Pills Automation Safety. I'm Sandy Smith and I'm Content Director of EHS Today. Before we start the webinar, let's go over some housekeeping items. If you have audio or visual difficulties or have trouble advancing the slides, please press your F5 key to refresh your webcast console. If you have technical difficulties during today's session, please press the Help button on your player console to receive assistance in solving common issues. This webinar technology allows you to resize the presentation by clicking the Maximize icon or by dragging the lower right corner to enlarge the window. We welcome your questions during today's event. In order to submit a question, type the question into the question window on the left side of your screen and then press the Submit button. We'll answer as many questions as possible during the Q&A session that will follow the presentation. You don't have to wait until the end of the presentation to ask your question. Feel free to send in your questions as they occur during the presentation and we'll add them to the queue. Today's session is being recorded and will be available on the EHS Today website within the next week for you to review. You'll be notified by email when the archive is available. On your console, the PILS logo is hotlinked, so if you want to visit their website during this webcast, you can click on the logo and a new window will open. This will not take you out of the webinar. And now I would like to introduce our presenter. Doug Sten is a safety consultant with PILS Automation Safety. He has degrees in safety engineering, safety management, behavioral science, and is a certified safety professional with a specialty in product safety. He also is a certified ergonomic analyst, a certified hazard control manager, and a CMSE certified machinery safety expert by TUV Nord. He has over 25 years experience in the plastics machinery industry as a subject matter consultant, a global product safety manager for an OEM, and a corporate safety director for a plastics container manufacturer. He has participated on U.S. and international safety standards committees. Welcome, Doug. The floor is yours. Thank you. Hello. Let's begin. Today's session, Lessons Learned, things that hopefully you can take away from the presentation. Selecting the prescribed safety standards, understanding the key factors of proper guard design, utilizing the proper guarding method and techniques, recognizing the proper guarding versus awareness barriers, and applying color coding and safety signs. Safety standards, risk reduction. This is part of the application where this helps you give helps give you guidance. There's three levels of the safety standards. A level basically deals with risk assessments. In the United States, it's ANSI B110. If your designing machine is going into Europe or you're within Europe, you rely on EN ISO 12100. Again risk assessment. They are somewhat similar in application and guidance. Your B-level standards apply to various safety guarding applications. And these are examples. These aren't all inclusive. You have an ANSI B11.19, which is a performance criteria for safeguarding. In Europe, you have EN ISO 14191, which deals with safety and machinery, particularly with interlocking guards. B-level applies to specific machines or equipment. For example, being in the plastics industry, ANSI SPI B151.31 is the safety requirements for blow molding machines. In Europe, it would be EN422 blow molding machines safety requirements. Safeguards, guards, provide protection by means of a physical barrier, protective devices, safeguards other than guards. Basically, we're talking about presence sensing devices. Safeguarding and interlocking, types of guards. We have fixed guards, enclosure guards, perimeter guards. We have movable guards, power-operated guards, 
self-closing guards, control guards. You have adjustable guards, interlocking guards, and interlocking guards with guard locking, and again, present sensing devices. Oh, that slide didn't come out too good. Let's go to the next one. Let's go back. Let's run that again, see what happened. No, we didn't get it. All right. Apologize for the technical aspect here. All right. Fixed guards. Fixed guard types are enclosure guards, particularly like on belts and pulleys or a chain pub. And then you have perimeter guards, that being around a robotic cell or a uh, stretch wrapper. Fixed guards, enclosure guards prevent access to the hazards from all sides, from the front, from the side, from the bottom, from the back. And typically on fixed guards, particularly with belts and pulleys, there's a drive mechanism with the shaft that's running in moving the belt and pulley. And back there is a greaser. So there are no controls, there are no e-stops, so it's extremely important that the back side, including the front sides and the bottoms, are properly guarded. You will also notice that the photos I show, for example, neither one is painted yellow. We'll talk about that a little later. Okay, fixed guards, get distance guards. Do not completely enclose the danger zone, but prevent or reduce access to virtue of their dimensions and their distance from the danger zone. And you can see the fixed the perimeter guard on the left, basically is a conveyor system, could be a robot cell, could be, uh, as I mentioned before, a stretch wrapper application. On the right is a tunnel guard. Now the openings that you can reach into from the standpoint, these tunnel guards are basically where product en enters a piece of equipment to be processed, cut, uh, some way, a process of uh, in the manufacturing, and then the product comes out the exit end. Well, at the exit end, there may be some hazards where it's easy to reach into, so you need to put the tunnel guard. In most applications, you set the end of the tunnel guard to the hazard, in most cases, have to be at least 40 inches. This allows you to have different size product coming out, standing on the floor, can't reach through to get to the hazard. Measuring openings in guards. You can see at the bottom, this is a guard opening measuring device, as you probably all have heard the term gotcha stick. So this is something where we, we can immediately measure putting the stick through the guard does the point of the measuring stick, does it reach the hazard before it's blocked by the width of the measuring stick? If it is, then the opening in the guard is adequate. Now, I come across this early in my career, uh, attending a National Safety Congress. Uh, this was published in the National Safety Council in 1977. This is a guide that an individual put together, and it's pretty much spot on. You have X over K plus a quarter inch equals Y. Now X equals the distance from the opening in the guard to the hazard. Y is the maximum opening in the guard to prevent access to the hazard. K is constant. Now in this author's publication, the constant factors were 6, 8, and 10. I'm using 10 because it's probably the most restrictive constant to use in this particular uh, formula. So if, for an example, if I had 10 inches from the hazard to the guard, I put 10 over 10 plus a quarter inch equals one inch and a quarter. That's the maximum opening based on this formula that I can have. Keep in mind that standard openings in either round or square uh, uh, perimeter fencing is either, what I've seen is either a one inch or a two inch. So 
if I have an inch and a quarter, I want to make sure I go down and not go up to a two inch. I want to have it an inch be more restrictive. I want to basically fault to the more cautious area. Now, in OSHA, seven and a half to 12 and a half inches, the opening can only be a, a, an inch and a quarter. But if I use the formula, seven and a half equals an inch. So it's a little bit more restrictive. The OSHA scale, you can see at 12 and a half to, excuse me, seven and a half to 12 and a half is an inch and a quarter. But when I go to 12 and a half to 15 and a half the distance, it only goes up to an inch and a half. So again, this is a guide. You have the OSHA standards. You have the uh, guard opening device. As again, I mentioned to you that it's uh, commonly referred to as the gotcha stick. And again, if you don't have those two, and if you have, you're out on the machine, and you have a, a tape measure or a ruler, you can do some measurements and come back and see where you are in relationship to using uh, basically the gotcha stick. Now, point of operation, point of hazard nip points on conveyors. And, and again, a lot of you out there uh, probably have uh, millions of miles of conveyor systems. And this is something that sometimes we neglect. The nip points can be found in many sea level standards. One particularly that pertains to conveyors is the ASME, which is American Society of Mechanical Engineers. These all require a maximum gap of six millimeters, which is about a quarter inch to prevent fingers from being drawn in. Many of users have gone down to four millimeters, which is an eighth of an inch. It's basically on the same opening criteria that OSHA requires on pedestal grinders, which is an eighth of an inch. You may stand down the edge of your fingerprints or you give yourself a good manicure but it's a minor injury versus your hand being drawn in, possibly uh, crushed or amputated in any larger size. So keep that in mind uh, when you are looking at writing requirements for guarding, particularly with conveyor systems. Okay, we do it in movable guards. They remain fixed to the machinery, for example, with hinges or guides to the machine frame or an adjacent fixed element and can be opened without the use of tools. They must be interlocked and include guard locking when necessary, particularly when you're dealing with high inertia applications. And again, this is a point of operation application that you can get in and out efficiently, productively, and safely. Minor servicing tasks as outlined in the OSHA standard, but also if you are familiar or have a copy of the ANSI Z244.1 standard, it talks about minor servicing tasks. They are routine, they are repetitive, and they're part of production. So I have an interlocking system that's an effective. It doesn't say it has to be a Category 3 or a Category 1. It when your risk assessment will make that determination what level of safety circuitry of integrity you will need for your interlocking systems to be able to perform minor servicing tasks. Movable guards, we have power operated guards. Movable guards operate with the assistance of power from a source other than a person, person's or gravity. You'll notice the photo on the bottom left is a 15-ton or 2,000-ton horizontal injection molding machine. And let's say, for example, this machine, as you know in the picture, there is no robotics. Excuse me, there are no robotics to this machine. So every 60 or 70 seconds, the operator is manually opening and manually closing this. Not only does this is fatiguing of physical stress, but also from the standpoint, it tends to uh, lead people to be creative and possibly bypassing the safety interlocking system. So power operated door, push the button, the door opens, just like an elevator. And on the front edge, it's got a, a pressure sensitive switch, like on an elevator in a hotel. 
that if somebody bumps it, it opens or stops in its position. When I finish manually pulling out the part, I go to the controls, I hit the button, the door closes, and the operation goes into cycle. Now, at the bottom, you've got a self-closing guard. Movable guards operate by a machine element or by the workpiece or part of the machinery, machining jig. So it allows the workpiece to pass and then automatically returns the closed position as soon as the workpiece has passed. As you see in the lower right, the cutoff saw. So the bottom of the blade retracts. Normally they are lexans so you can see where you want to cut. And again, it allows you to cut. It protects the side coming in from the sides. When you op open the saw, the guard automatically closes. Adjustable guards. These are fixed or movable guards which are adjustable as a whole or which incorporate adjustable parts. Allow access to areas only where it is strictly necessary. Adjustable manually or automatically depending on the type of work involved. Reduce as far as possible the risk of injection. Easily adjustable without the use of tools so the operator is not tempted to adjust guards to their fully open position at all times. Guards must not be removed. Well, let's take a look. Here's an example of an adjustable guard. Telescopic guard to provide ready adjustment to the surface of the workpiece. What you see in front of you is a drill press with a Lexan guard that extends below the drill. And what happens here is the fact is when it comes down, you can see it make contact with the workpiece, but it contains any of the filings, or if the drill bit happens to break, it keeps it within the area from a design standpoint. Guard interlocking, removing of power from the actuators. Guard interlocking with guard locking. Locking the guard until the hazard has ceased, stopped, or stopped. And again, an example is a rotating wrapper arm on a stretch wrapper. This is high inertia. Or if you have a particular machine that you do not want people to get into until the cycle has completed, then guard locking application is an, an adequate uh, method. Talk a little bit about present sensing devices. These devices sense body approaching, or you're within the safeguard and you're standing in the beam, particularly that of a floor scanner, or you have on the left, you have a 3D scanner, nothing will move because you're constantly interrupting the power. With light currents, remember, once you pass through the light current, it shuts the machine off. However, once you're inside the light currents, the reset button should be in direct line of an individual seeing into the danger zone to basically check that area before resetting the, the reset, the blue reset button. Now the applications for these type of devices, and these are just some examples, are palletizers, manual loading and unloading. You see in industry, the manual loading and unloading in a power press. And the fact of it is, I you know, they're set up which they mute, they come on, they go off, especially when you're dealing with cycles of loading and unloading within the 10 to 15 seconds. And robots, again, from the standpoint as the proper application, you know, how they're being used, and many more. And one of the other items is the ergonomic advantage. I'm not opening and closing a door. Um, you know, putting uh, physical stress on my arms, my wrists, my shoulders, especially when you're dealing with very short cycle times in the process. So again, these present sensing devices you know, maintain a high level of safety, and in conjunction, they are, as I mentioned earlier, an ergonomic advantage. Proper guarding versus awareness barriers. 
Trimmer guarding needs to be a minimum height of 63 inches, that's 1,600 millimeters, with a maximum gap at the bottom and horizontally of 7 inches, 180 millimeters, to prevent full body access. Now remember, this is full body access. This is not reaching hand through with your hands and fingers and arm. That's a whole different perspective on the type of guarding and how you want to approach that. Standard handrail is 42 inches, which is 1,067 millimeters. You can climb over it, you can climb through it, climb under the barrier. So there are differences when you look at applications and my concern of keeping people separated from pedestrians to vehicle traffic then, or keeping people from falling off a platform is an area where, again, you're using the hand mid-rail applications. And again, uh, mentioning we're talking about, you know, railing, uh, basically uh, these could have been gray or blue, but a lot of companies will paint their guard yellow because uh, from a visual perspective. Now, interlocking guard verification of legacy equipment. And when I speak of legacy equipment, I'm speaking of older equipment that may not have the safety circuit integrity that should be on the machine. And sometimes it's, it's, it's a lower safety application but sometimes it's an issue of when and resources and time to up them. So what I have done in safety uh, workshops is to share uh, with, the, with the audience uh, a three-step process. And again, this is, you know, at, at the time, check for issues dealing with water, dealing with heat, dealing with vibration because a lot of the legacy like equipment, they're single channel. So anything could cause it to fail and possibly fail to the unsafe condition. And so I've shared this with, again, with customers and possibly putting this into their PM process. You know, at least on, you know, it could be daily, weekly. But here's the three-step process. When the guard is open, hazardous machine function stops. Okay, good with that. While the guard is open, no hazardous machine functions are permitted to occur when I push the start button or the reset button. Guard's open, I can push the buttons all day, nothing's going to move. When I shut the door, the machine will not start automatically without first actuating the start control button. So these are three elements that I've, steps that I have uh, recommended to clients when they want to do some verification checking on legacy equipment that are interlocked but may not be the safety uh, integrity that they that they're looking for. Okay, guard expectations. They need to protect against inadvertent and in intentional contact with the hazard. Many of the customers that I work with have this in their specifications, particularly not only within their plants, but also with new machines coming out. And if you're in the automotive industry, this is a perfect acronym for you to ensure auto in the design of the guard. I can't get around. I can't get under. I can't get through. I cannot get over the guard to get into the hazardous movement or motion cause injury. So keep that in mind when you'll talk to people and say, well, uh, we're just worried about inadvertent. Need to look at intentional contact with the hazard. In designing as an OEM, you need to design for the intent and of the use of the machine and the misuse of that particular machine. So again, keep these things in mind that you need to protect against inadvertent and intentional contact the hazard. Proper guarding approaches. Not impede safe work. And I, I know I've used this, this term in the risk assessment, and again, it's very important, operator compatible. 
guard should be constructed and installed so that they do not prevent an employee from safely performing the job. You can throw a net over a machine and say, well, my job's done, but the operator, the maintenance person can't do their job. So I've got to design a safeguarding system that reduces the risk down to an acceptable level to allow the operator to work within a safe area in a safe condition and still allow them to perform the jobs that they're expected. If you don't, operators that I've worked with over the years will find ways to buy a passenger safety system. So it has to be compatible with the operations, for maintenance, with quality, with engineering. So take that you know, into consideration. Not overly large or cumbersome. We've got ergonomics involved in this. A movable, removable fixed guard should be light enough to easily remove or lift, requiring a reasonable amount of force to move it out of the way. How many screws do I really need to secure it in place? I've seen guards with 12 screws in it and really maybe only needed four. So do I need handles? Is it big enough? Is it going to take two men and a boy to pick it up and put it back in place? So again, your guards take into consideration what the ergonomic issues may be involved. Reliable moving parts. Moving parts of the guard, for example, attachment, hinges, slides, handles, catches, shall be selected to ensure reliable operation given their foreseeable usage and working environment. When we talk about fixed guards, I've always recommended as a best practice to use captive screws. That way they always stay with the fixed guard. They're not in the maintenance tech's pocket or they're not kicked under the machine. You've probably all seen a fixed guard that had six bolts in it and come back a month later, there's four bolts in it. You come back another month later, there's two bolts, and the next thing you know, the guard's hanging by a tie wrap. So again, having captive screws is a very good best practice in the industry. Openings for materials or product flow. We talked about this a little earlier. When a guard requires openings to permit a passage of materials, injection of product, or access to machine adjustments, the opening shall be small enough or distance enough to prevent employee access to moving parts or machine hazards, preventing the operator's hand or fingers from reaching the hazard. Again, this is, just to clarify, this is standing on the work floor, on the platform, not from the standpoint of climbing up on a conveyor system. It's basically on the, standing on the floor, reaching through an opening, whether it's parts going in, parts coming out, where's the hazard, how far out do I need to provide that tunnel guard? Allow convenient adjustments. Guards and machinery should be designed to enable routine adjustments without opening or removing guards. Makes sense. A lot of times that operators and maintenance technicians have to make adjustments on the fly. So it's better to have your adjustments outside and it deters individuals from bypassing interlocks or taking fixed guards off and running the machine live. So again, take this in consideration. Next, we'll allow routine lubrication and maintenance. Same thing. Guards machinery designed to enable lubrication and maintenance without opening the guard. A lot of machines have grease certs. Extend the grease certs so they come out through the guards. Maintenance people be happy. Production people be happy because you're not shutting my machine down. I know a lot of you probably have Saturdays and Sundays or days where you shut the machine down and do monthly maintenance. But again, for those that don't, kind of a hit and miss, this is the, you know, it's the ideal world. Create no quality or sanitary hazards. Guards, particularly dealing in the food industry, you know, you've got to guard it, but you also have to work with the quality people from the standpoint there are certain aspects in quality that deals, again, with the food safety industry that are designed not to create a quality or sanitary issue by trapping food or fluid, which become term should be aseptic. Securely anchored, she is designed 
for a fixed location, including pedestrian mounted maintenance and equipment, are recommended to be securely anchored to prevent movement or walking. Tamper resistant. Guards and devices must be securely attached to the machine so that the employees shall not be able to easily remove or defeat safeguards. Okay. Tamper resistant. I'm not sure if uh, people talk about tamper proof, uh, talk about child proof bottles. You know, kids get into them, right? I think bad choice of words. So again, tamper resistant. Use certain screws that make it very difficult and tools to remove them like snake eyes or non-reversible screws. Uh, these are very good. If you're an OEM, the thing would be is to use those screws and to use some type of red epoxy glue over top of those. That way you have an idea that something happens, you know people have tampered with it. Okay, mount it to the machine. The guarding shall be mounted to the machine so it can move as one unit. If this is not possible, then the guarding is required to be floor mounted. Cross braces attached to guards and machines shall be used. Again, with perimeter guarding, if you have angle irons holding up the perimeter guarding, make sure that angle iron is on the inside of the guarding so that angle cannot be used as a foothold. Rigid. Guards should be made of a rigid material that will withstand the conditions of use and cannot be bent or deflected to allow access to the hazard. I've seen a lot of polycarbonate Lexan guards that are not solidly framed where people can bend the corners and still maintain the interlock function and reach through because they don't want to shut the machine down and start it back up. So it's very important that the guards be rigid and they cannot flux to be able to be bypassed. Allow a view of process. This is extremely important, not only for production, but maintenance. Guards should be designed and constructed to offer adequate viewing of essential processes or operation. Black sand. If you have expanded metal, paint it the same color as the machine, or paint it flat black so you can see inside the machine, whether it's for over top belts and pulleys, or whether it has to do with uh, a chain and sprockets. So you can view them without shutting the machine down or shutting the machine down and locking it out and having to remove a guard for five to ten seconds to an exam do a visual examination. So again, very, very important is to allow a viewing process. And the same when the in the production area, in the point of operation. And again, probably the most important of all these is that the guard you put on does not present a hazard in themselves or create a new hazard. Color coding and safety labels. There is no compliance requirement that guards have to be painted yellow, and yet I see them all over the place when I go into a plant. If you're an OEM, unless you want to paint yellow and that's your requirement, that's okay. But there, I wanted for sharing with you is that there is no U.S. standard, there's no standard in Europe that I've come across. And one thing that working with with engineers when I was working for an OEM with engineers is the fact two things that basically they sort of adhere to in their design is two things. One is functionality. Did I design it to, to, to the expectations of the functionality? And two, they may not say this, but aesthetics. They want it to look pretty from the standpoint it's all painted gray, it's all painted blue, it's all painted beige, but now you put these yellow freckles on it where the guards are. If that's, as an end user, if that's your requirement, so be it. But again, uh, it costs a little bit more in the painting process. Take the guards off, paint them, and put them back on again. So again, just keep that in mind. And basically, yellow is used for as a caution. When a guard or protection cannot be provided where it's not feasible, Basically, if there's a low support structure that may cause a, a bump or hit hazard when walking under it, it's not six foot eight, it's a little lower, there's a, there's a visual awareness that this is low, watch your hit. I can't guard against that. Safety labels in regards to the guard on machines should only be affixed to a form 
of residual risks. Example, hot surface, sharp moving knives. These are things when I open up an interlock door and I use the example of a uh, shuttle, uh, a plastic molding machine. I open up the door, everything stops. But right in front of me, I've got a hot knife. I can't protect it because it's part of the process. So I put a warning there, hot, wear protective gloves. I want to address the thermal issue, and I wanted to address a hot knife. It's a residual risk. That's all I need. And if I have my safety system up to the integrity that it should be, I shouldn't have to worry about putting all these other signs about crutch hazards and all those things. You've addressed that in your design. But residual risks, and again, we talk about the fixed guards for belt to pulleys. And those are items that you can operate the machine without the guards in place. So you have a residual risk that they could remove the guards and not put them back in place. Another item to keep in mind and I've seen this applied, when I want to say very deliberately, that safety signs should never, never, never be affixed to fixed guards. And I, re I, I refer to them as being on the buddy plan. If one goes away, the other one takes along. So as I mentioned before, if you're putting safety signs as an awareness device to remind particularly the maintenance tech to put the guards back in place, then that emergency, that, excuse me, that safety sign should be on the black back plate of the belt and pulley. So when I take that guard up, that safety sign is constantly in front of me reminding me to put the guards back in place. This is a high-risk table. Uh, this is both in the ISO standard, as mentioned, as stated here, and also it's in the uh, ANSI B11.19 standard. There's a high risk and a low risk chart. As a safety consultant, I typically use the high risk chart. So again, it talks about the, you know, how far, how high should the protective device be uh, in relationship to how high the hazard is in relationship to how far the hazard is away from the guard in order uh, to protect the 99 percentile from reaching over the guard. Guarding alternatives. Safe distance cannot be met, yet alternatives can be recommended. Swinging guard doors that are interlocked. A power interlocking door. The photo to the left is a power door used for a tilt dumpster that is dumping preforms into a sorting bowl. The door goes up, the operator pushes with a uh, floor cart, pushes the uh, tote in, pulls the uh, cart out, pushes a button, door comes down. As soon as it reaches the bottom out, there's a switch saying OK. Then the tilt dumper goes up, does what it has to do. The operator can walk away. As soon as it's finished dumping, the tilt dumper comes down. And when it comes down to the floor, there's a switch saying, I'm down, I'm safe. The door automatically comes up. And the operator doesn't have to be there from the standpoint of being able to do other things. Uh, the present sensing devices, uh, you've got a light curtain to the right. Keep in mind that if you're only, if you have high light curtains, like in this particular situation, you want to make sure that you do not mute all the sensors on that light curve, only enough to allow the product on the pallet, on the conveyor, to pass through, and not all of the all the lights being all the sensors being muted. The tendency is, if you do that, again, it's happened uh, from time to time. People will get on the pallet and ride through into the area. You know, sometimes they get bored. So keep that in mind when moving products through a light curtain. Okay, other guarding techniques. The one on the left is the guard within a guard. If I have to make an air adjustment on a valve and I can't move it to the outside, well, I can put a horizontal plate which restricts 
my arm from reaching down at 5 o'clock, there's the hazard. But I can reach straight through and make an adjustment, which is not a hazard, and make the adjustment when the machine is operating or on the fly. The one to the right is the pressure sensing floor. This is on conveyors. I'm not sure how many conveyor companies out there provide this, but you see the X, that is a floating plate, which is four foot long, that is basically set to weight. And normally, as an OEM, uh, in my uh, other life, we used to have these designs up with a conveyor company, particularly in Europe, and we used to set the weights at 75 pounds. You could run anything, basically any kind of bottles over, and any size bottles, so I didn't have to worry about the openings. But if you climbed on it, the pressure plate was designed to actuate with the emergency stop function. So it's very, very effective. Uh, it allows various size of products to come across. And again, you can set the weight basically like a pressure mat. Complementary safety devices. I want to touch base with it on you on a couple of these items. One is it minimizes the severity of the event. It doesn't prevent the event. I got my sleeve caught on a conveyor system. I hit the e-stop. Well, I may end up with maybe a bruise. However, you know, if I don't have it, it could be worse. Their emergency stops by the NFPA 79 standard are either category zero or category one. Category zero is I hit the e-stop. It continues, it re releases, it removes the power, and then whatever it is, it keeps drifting until it comes to close to a stop. You have to deal your risk assessment, which one do you want? Mode one is, the category one, excuse me, I get the e-stop, there's a braking system, it stops, and then it drops power out. In the picture, you get a lack of lockable half, should not be used for a lot of, I've seen a lot of these with customers. And the other thing, for lockout tag out is the standard says you cannot use controls for in this particular application as a lockout tag out. Other thing I want to touch base with I didn't put in text is protective rings around an e stop. If you're having issues with nuisance stops in this particular position that it's horizontal, turn the e stop if you can in a box, turn it ninety degrees so it's on top and it's sitting vertical. It's easily, it's readily accessible. I can hit it with my head, my elbow, my shoulder. But if I put a ring around it, it's by OSHA's definition, it's not readily accessible. Only if I push it in with a ring, I'm not hitting with my palm. I'm basically hitting it with my fingers. So, again, keep that in mind when you're looking at your e-stops. Okay. In summary, fix guards. The advantages. Protect all individuals basically for power transmission. It's not a requirement. It's basically a best practice in the industry. It's not dependent on user interaction. It's simple to install and maintain. It saves floor space. Inspection is easy if, again, you can see through it when the machine is stopped. And control hazards acts as, as a shield, ejected material, hazardous liquids, Noise, radiation, laser, light, explosion, welding, disadvantages. It's got limited access. It may limit visibility if not properly designed, as we talked before. Lexan, expanded metal, can be forgotten to place when removal or maintenance. And as I mentioned before, is that proper design is if you're painting guards yellow, particularly expanded metal, Keep in mind, if you ever look through a yellow expanded metal or orange and red, it has a tendency to diffuse what we call your visual acuity, which means it's very difficult to see if something's bright yellow because your eye is attracted to the yellow and not being able to see past it. So again, if you're in the food industry, you have no choice. It's stainless steel expanded metal, no paint at all. But if you're on the packaging side or if you're in another industry, then I strongly recommend that you expand in metal, that you use flat black or the same color of the machine. Again, the disadvantage is 
you can operate the machine without guards in place. And we've seen that out during risk assessments. Summary on movable guards, the advantages. Protects all individuals. Point of operation, this is the area where I get into frequency. This is where the product is being processed. I've got a jam, I'm doing, I'm doing cleaning, I'm doing minor adjustments. Has various insulation types. You know, we talked about interlock doors, locking interlock doors. We're talking about present sensing devices. It saves floor space. Guards have to be in place for the machine, before the machine will operate. Can contain hazards such as a shield, ejecting materials, hazards, particularly we're talking about physical guards. The disadvantages, they limit access may limit visibility if not properly designed, basically the same thing, require interlocking or inter interlocking with guard locking. Perimeter fencing may need extra floor space. So you've got something in place, but to put the, the guard, the perimeter guard, it has to be so high and so far from the hazard so you couldn't reach over. So it may have an issue with the real estate within your uh, shop floor. And remember, in closing, to err is human, to forgive is design. Great, Doug. Thanks for that presentation. And we have already received quite a few questions, so we're going to jump right in. And while Doug is answering your questions, please take a moment to complete the feedback form that appears on the left side of your screen. And our first question, um, what is your recommendation to protect robots? Well, robots, there is a robotic standard. Uh, it tells you what you need for uh, what you're using it for. If there's the possibility of the product being let loose of the end of the robot, robot you need to have physical guarding. Uh, your control reliability has to be at least a Category 3. And if you're Europe, you're talking about a performance level rating of at least a D, uh, self-checking, monitoring uh, in that perspective. But again, based on if you've got a robot that's moving, if you're in the, uh, uh, say, the, the pharmaceutical industry, all you're moving is little fill boxes, maybe a light curtain uh, around size. Uh, but again, there is a robotic standard that's a C-level standard. If you do that and apply that, you should have no problems. Okay. Um, are ANSI standards considered regulations like OSHA or Cal OSHA standards? No. The regulations, it's a little bit different here than in Europe, but in the United States, your regulations are your federal OSHA and your state OSHA programs. The, the ANSI standards are consensus standards. You have a number of subject matter experts to get together uh, both from a manufacturing and also from an end user's perspective uh, and a product's perspective sit together to design minimum requirements you know, for safeguarding on the machine, whether it's physical guarding or whether it's distances, whether it's speed. They get together and put things. If they are for the end user, they are they're not requirements. However, caveat here is, if you look at the 1910.6 standard, it talks about OSHA using consensus standards and citing you. If it's not in there, they'll go to a consensus standard. If you're not following the consensus standard, they could, could I'm not saying they would, they could cite you under the general duty clause. So again, it's important what you have is, are there any consensus standards, not only from meeting the standard, but how can I maximize the protection of my workers? Okay. Um, one of our attendees said that he is curious to see, to hear your perspective um, about redundancy of controls in building an effective safety envelope. And he uses an example, um, barrier and uh, present sensing devices um, working collaboratively. With the with collaboratively, you're, I might have to remark for referring probably, and I don't want to assume probably with dealing with robust, but that's when I hear the word collaborative, more or less uh, kind of associating that with robust. But redundancy, 
uh, having a redundant system that's dual channeled from your switch switches back through safety relays, you're automatically monitoring and checking your safety system. And that way, if there's a failure in the system, any component in either one of the channels, it will detect that and it will allow the machine to come to a safe condition and will, if it's designed properly, not allow you to start the machine back up until you fix or repair what the component failed in either one of the, the channels. Okay. If you purchase a piece of equipment such as a pump and part of the shaft that spins is showing and there is no guard on it from the factory, are you required to put one on? Uh, it all depends. If the shaft is smooth and it sticks out further than half the diameter, yes. If the end of the shaft has Allen screws or has keyways, it doesn't make any difference how far it sticks out, it needs to be guarded. Okay. Is there a standard or rule of thumb for deciding between barrier perimeter guards and enclosing guards? No, it has to deal with doing your risk assessment. Basically, perimeter guards, you're, you're covering a more area. Now, if you have belts and pulleys on a particular machine within the perimeter guard, it's a good idea to put uh, the enclosure guards on the belts and pulleys and the chain and cog. The perimeter guard, again, you have sometimes you have those pretty close to the perimeter guard that I could reach under and into the hazards that are created by belts and pulleys and chain and cog. I've seen a lot of this, particularly in, in the, the food industry. All right. Uh, next question, standards change all the time. What is your recommendation on guarding previously inadequately guarded equipment in relation to equipment service warranty? Service warranty. Um, can we repeat the question again, please? Sta standards change all the time. What is your recommendation on guarding previously inadequately guarded equipment in relation to equipment service warranty? So I'm guessing maybe something where um, uh, information that's included with the equipment um, is outdated under current standards, perhaps? My, my recommendation would be in the standards, most of the standards that I've worked on, particularly the sea level standards uh, in, the, in the plastics industry as dealing with low molding and injection molding and horizontal molding machines, is the fact that they give a three-year period where old machines, and again, it's the consensus standard, need to be brought up to current safety standards. And so it's important that you look at your machine and look at the practicality and the feasibility of bringing those machines, older machines, uh, up to the new standards. And I agree, the standards do change. Technology changes. Uh, there's a lot of things we put in the uh, the uh, 244.1 standard with, with controlling hazardous energy because of the, the, the current and ongoing advances in technology. So again, my recommendation was if you've got older equipment, you've got to do a risk assessment. I would, I would recommend doing a risk assessment and if there's items that you need, find out that you need to raise the level of safety integrity of your circuitry then I recommend you, you should find ways to do that. Okay. And uh, I would like to just remind our audience that they still have time to ask a question. So send it in. We have about five minutes left on this presentation. Um, someone asked, what types of guards um, are easiest and cheapest to implement? And maybe let's add um, most effective in there as well as cheapest and easiest. Well, here's the thing of the application. If we're talking about power transmission, rotating shafts, whether it's the shaft, the end of the shaft, or whether it's belts and pulleys, things that are creating power transmission, the most effective and the cheapest would be fixed guards. 
because basically those are not removed. Even with rotating shafts, you put a guard over it, the grease jerk is right next to the drive uh, shaft, let's say on a belt and pulley or a chain and top. So you get in there, you can go in, and you can service that lubrication point without taking the fixed guard off. Uh, same way with belts and pulleys. If you design the guards up, they rarely come off uh, any sooner than six months, and there are cheaper. Uh, when you get into interlock doors, you're getting into safety circuitry, you're getting into the expense of components. So again, whatever your application is, that if it's power transmission, six guards are the most effective, and the fact they're the cheapest. And if you get into point of operation where you're in there, uh, the frequency is uh, routine, uh, you don't want to put a fixed guard because after a while, they'll end up in the back of your facility in the barbecue pit, and they won't get put back on again. So again, during your risk assessment, the frequency of exposure, those are the two deviations between whether you use a cheap fixed guard. And again, I, I, I want to emphasize on your fixed guards, my recommendation as a best practice is to use captive screws that are always with the guard. Okay. And another um, question about guards. Someone wants to know, how can I get guards to reduce the footprint of the process? Light curtains require a lot of space. Well, um, they don't really, well, the light curtains, the one thing you've got to concern about light curtains is scanners are on the floor. And from the standpoint, you can use scanners, which is fine. You can use light curtains both vertically and horizontally. Now, if you're using light curtains horizontally, they have to be at least four feet long. That way, in the standard, people can't jump over them. But again, from the standpoint of distance, and you also, if you're if you have them installed vertically, you've got to make sure that you do safe distance calculations that the light curtains are back far enough that if I break the light curtain, all hazardous motion and movement will stop or cease. So if you're putting light curtains in and you've got them all sitting on print on uh, fencing, make sure that you have done the calculations that the light curtains are back far enough to, again, when they're actuated, that they stop all hazardous motion, motion and movement. Because what I found is that people will put the or hang them and say, well, this is a good distance. You need to validate that the light currents are at a safe distance to stop hazardous motion and movement before that individual gets to the hazard. Okay. Um, can international operations rely on a proper safety rated system for protection when performing service and maintenance tasks such as unjamming parts? Okay, now here's the thing. It's kind of uh, unjamming parts. If you are manually unjamming a part, pulling it out during, and again, jams, machines are not built. I've never seen one unless there are some out there, are 100% efficient. They do jam. Somebody puts the wrong part in or it goes out of adjustment, and their jams occur. If you're not disassembling, components to take the jam out, once you start dis disassembling using a tool, then that becomes, goes, that kind of moves into the lockout tag out into Europe, uh, preventing unexpected movement or motion. So if I'm opening up a jam, taking out a jam, and I can pull the jam out, shut the door, start the machine back up, those are considered, in my opinion, and, and, if, and if you talk to others in the industry, as routine, repetitive, and part of production is removing a jam. But once you get into a jam that I need tools to disassemble something, get in, it gets jammed. Now all bets are off. Now you're looking at you know, controlling hazardous energy through your lockout tagout procedures. Okay. And with that, we've run out of time, and I would like to thank you, Doug, and our sponsor, Pills Automation Safety, for this great webinar. Um, as a reminder, if you are registered as a group, 
please add the names and emails of all in attendance on the exit survey. And remember that in probably less than a week, you will re be receiving an email letting you know that the webinar is archived on ehstoday.com. And on behalf of EHS Today, I would like to ask all of you to have a safe and productive remainder of the day.